Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Sharon Fitzpatrick, and I'm your co-host for today's webinar, Hacks, Tricks, and Shortcuts, Oh My! Discover PowerPoint tricks even the pros didn't know about. With Taylor Kroonquist, joining me as co-host is Dave Zielinski, a presentation expert. Today's webinar is part of our Expert Thinking Program, which offers a robust peer-to-peer -peer community for presentation professionals to share ideas, resources, and start discussions. In addition, Webinar Wednesdays offer engaging conversations with presentation experts like Rick Altman, Gitesh Bajaj, Mike Parkinson, Ellen Finkelstein, Nolan Haim, and others. We wanted to just remind you to join the conversation. Hashtag presentation expert on tweeting. It is my pleasure to introduce Dave Zielinski, the editor of Presentation Expert. He is an award-winning writer. His book, Master Presenter, Lessons from the World's Top Experts on Becoming a More Influential Speaker, is getting rave reviews. You can order it online or get it through our website. Dave, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks a lot, Sharon, and welcome everyone to our first webinar of 2015. We hope to see you for future sessions this year as well. I'm pleased to introduce Taylor Kroonquist as our speaker today. Taylor is the co-founder and productivity guru for Nuts and Bolts Speed Training Company, which helps companies build better PowerPoint slides in shorter time frames. Nuts and Bolts does that by teaching actionable strategies and techniques to help people fast track through repetitive tasks and solve their daily PowerPoint woes. Hailing from the home of Microsoft and Starbucks, Taylor also came up with the one-arm mouse technique in order to be able to combine these two passions, creating slides with a coffee in one hand and a mouse in the other. With that, Taylor, I will hand it over to you. Perfect. Awesome. Okay, well, this is Taylor, and um, I'm excited to be here for the first webinar of 2015. And first and foremost, I just wanted to thank everybody for attending. I realize that everyone's extremely busy and that taking an hour out of your day isn't easy. So I just wanted to let you know that I value your time, and I expect to deliver value not only with great tips and tricks, but hopefully the beginning of a new mindset that you can use to begin tackling the building aspect of your presentations. And if I go to the next slide, our agenda today is pretty simple and straightforward. This is just a quick agenda. Again, I'm going to kind of quickly make the case for speed. Um, I want to quickly show you my setup. It'll just take a couple of minutes, which will help to make more sense as we work through some of the live demonstrations. And then everybody's favorite, I'm going to walk through some of my favorite PowerPoint tricks. And I'm excited to show you some new ones that I haven't showed online anywhere before. So you guys are the first. And the first section, if you will, is really just the theory portion, which I'm going to try to whip through as fast as I can because I know everybody always likes to see the tricks. And just as a quick reminder, there is a PDF cheat sheet that you can all get access to. Sharon will share a link with you that you can download it. So don't feel like you have to jot everything down. Everything that I'm going to cover today is in that handout. And if you want to hang around after the webinar, I will stick around and answer as many questions as you have or until Sharon kicks me off of the webinar. And with that, I just want to say to set the stage for these tricks, uh, these are not random PowerPoint tricks that I tried to come up with to impress you and to get some attention. All right, these are tricks that I use almost every time I use PowerPoint. And the quick backstory on this is that all of this speed or this foundation of speed in these tricks were all inspired by a Chinese cubicle. And the only reason that cubicle in this story is Chinese is that's where Camille, the other founder of Nuts and Bolts Speed Training, and I both lived and worked for 10 years. I was in consulting and in finance. Camille worked in PR and marketing and event planning. And the common thread there is that we were always building slides with a ton of information on them. Right? We're not talking about the Steve Jobs approach to PowerPoint here. I'm talking about PowerPoint, the, basically the types of PowerPoint creation PowerPoint presentations that everyone tells you that you shouldn't be building, right? Slides full of operating data, projections, competitor analysis, research, and although these are not the types of slides you're supposed to be building, these are the kind of decks that are often expected of you 
or by your clients in the professional services industry, right? If an investor asks me for a pitch book about a company that's for sale, for example, I can't just send them a slide like this and say, yep, we got to the bottom of everything, everything looks A-OK, -okay. all right? Instead, the types of slides that we were often building looked something more along the lines of this. So lots of information, sometimes there's pictures, sometimes there's not, charts, tables, hierarchies, the works. And you know, these are the types of slides that are sometimes presented live, sometimes they're just sent around for a conference call, and sometimes they're just printed or emailed for some review, but whatever the format, you can't skimp on the detail. And although you do want these slides to be as visual as possible, the underlying factor here is that there's a lot of moving pieces, and they're, and they're complicated to build. And this is where the strategies and techniques, I just urge you to think of the strategies and techniques that you use or don't use will make such a big difference when you're working in PowerPoint. And here I have a quick example. So if this was just, for example, a draft overview of maybe manufacturing facilities of a company, uh, maybe a client that you're consulting, which doesn't look very complicated and might seem simplistic, but if I flip to the next slide, I'm going to try to go slow here because I do realize that there's sometimes lag online. If I flip to the next slide, you can see that this simplistic slide is actually made up of 81 different objects. So that's 81 moving pieces that you're responsible for, which when marked here in orange kind of looks like the chicken pox. And so how long it takes you to kind of build out and manage a slide like this, again, really comes back to the techniques that you're using. So when we think about doing something in PowerPoint or when we're getting started, you know, Camille and I were always asking ourselves, how do we take a 20-minute task and turn it into two? Or if something took somebody 20 clicks to perform, you know, is there a way that I could get it down to one or two? You know, that's the baseline fa the foundation of this entire speed concept I'm talking about. Because whereas your boss might not care how long it takes you to complete the deck, they just want it in their hands by 7 a.m. in the morning before the meeting, you know, as the person building your deck, you definitely care how long it takes you to build. And if you've seen our YouTube videos, that's where we came up with this whole slogan of make it the happy hour, which is where we found most people would rather be. So I hope that some of these tricks to be covered today will help to get you there. Now, I do want to say I know that we have a lot of presentation experts on the call and that we all have our personal preferences on our slides, and I ask that you please focus on the application of the tips and tricks that I'm teaching you and not on whether or not you like my slides. All right? If you focus on the application, I guarantee you'll be able to use some of these tricks to save yourself an enormous amount of time and heartache in PowerPoint. So that's just my quick intro. Let's now quickly talk about speed. And although this sounds obvious, who wouldn't want to be faster at PowerPoint? As there's no one really seems to be talking about this, I'm excited to share this with you because I believe there's a couple of things that anybody on this call can do to immediately begin reclaiming some lost time in the program. And the first piece of this to always remember is that speed is on the keyboard. This is where so many people are losing so much time. You want to use your keyboard for just about everything. And yes, this is true for other programs, but here in PowerPoint, this is where I see the most people, or this is where I see most people not using this enough. Instead, they're clicking their life away with their mouse. And my favorite little graphic to show this, if this is your standard keyboard, right, the orange keys, this might seem pretty basic, but the orange keys, the control, the shift, and the alt keys are what I call your shortcut accelerators, and you would use those to hit your shortcuts, which I have marked here in blue. And these blue shortcuts that I've marked up here on this keyboard represent some of my favorite PowerPoint shortcuts, roughly between 30 to 60 shortcuts, depending on how you want to count them. And these are all, in, again, included on that PDF shortcut cheat sheet that you can download from Presentation Expert. So you don't need to screenshot this, or if you have a question about what a shortcut is, you can go check it out there. Um, I do want you to pay special attention to the numbers there at the top of my keyboard. These are my Quick Access Toolbar Shortcuts, or QAT, 
And if you've never used your QAT before, you're in for a treat because I'm going to show you how to, I'm going to quickly touch on this in just a second. And if you have heard of the QAT before or maybe rolling your eyes, if you're like most people, then you aren't taking this seriously enough. And to prove my point, here's a short blurb from Charles, someone that we've worked with, who basically said, wow, the QAT is a game changer. All right? And Charles has been using PowerPoint since the beginning, and he spends his entire life in the program. All right? He basically flies around the world and rehauls presentations for medical conferences, so he's far from a newbie. So my only point here is that if Charles, a veteran, was not getting the most out of his QAT, the chances are that you aren't either. So when I get to this point in a second, please don't check out. I'm not just giving you fluffy tips here. I'm giving you the secret sauce, if you will, to speed. But first, before we get to the QAT, so I want to come back to the keyboard. So you need your keyboard. You want to use this for just about everything. But in PowerPoint, you also need a dedicated mouse. All right? Even with all of our shortcuts, PowerPoint is a click and drag heavy program. There's some things that are always going to be faster with a dedicated mouse. But by a dedicated mouse, I do mean that the trackpad and the dot in the center of your circle, or in the center of your keyboard, does not count as a dedicated mouse. I've had a lot of people tell me that they're so fast with their trackpad, and then I watch them perform a task in PowerPoint, and it honestly hurts. It's like watching your parents perform some task on the computer, and you just want to jump in and save them, but you can't. So my recommendation is that unless you're on an airplane, or you're in an emergency situation, you should not be using the trackpad if you're really crunching a PowerPoint deck, you want to stick with the dedicated mouse. It doesn't have to be anything fancy either. It can be a, a, have a cord, it can be USB, just a dedicated mouse. And just as a quick little graphic of why you want to use your keyboard whenever possible is if these are your hands and you just park them on your keyboard, this is basically the position you want to be in, just you know, crunching your shortcuts. And the reason I say that is because to find the command with your mouse looks something like this. First, you have to split your hand to go grab your mouse, which takes some time. Then you have to go hunt around somewhere up in your ribbon or your toolbar to go find the command that you're looking for. And then you have to put your hands back on your keyboard, which in comparison to just parking your hands on the keyboard in the first place and just nailing those commands with your keyboard is ridiculously slow. So that's the first piece that I want to talk about the keyboard. The second part is I want to quickly show you my setup that you can kind of mimic, and this will just take a couple of minutes. And first off on this next slide, I just have a screenshot of my ribbon after hitting the Alt key. And I will go into PowerPoint and show this to you in a second. Um, I just want to make the first point that you have these, or what I call the ribbon guides there at the top which are simply visual shortcuts to the commands up in your ribbon. And this only works on PC, so to PowerPoint 2007, 10, and 13. These ribbon guides are not on a Mac yet, which is unfortunate. So you have your ribbon guides up top, and down below, here's what you have as these quick access toolbar guides or the QAT guides. And if I go to the next slide, I'm going to hit Escape to come into present or the normal view of the presentation. I'm going to, again, try to do all this demonstration slow so that you can see what I'm doing. I understand there's some lag. If something lags too much, just tell me and I will redo it. So if I was going to, for example, just to demonstrate the uh, ribbon guides, if I selected all of the text in an object and I wanted to add bullet points from my keyboard, I would hit and let go of the Alt key. You can see all of the guides open up there across the top of my screen. I would hit H for Home, which opens up the Home tab ribbon. I would then, still keeping my hands on my keyboard, hit the U, which opens up the bullet dropdown. And here you can just cycle to whatever bullet points you want to use and hit Enter. All right, so all accomplished on my keyboard. And I'll have another example of some more of this in just a second. So if I just go to Shift F5, back to presentation mode. So that was the ribbon guides. Now let's take a quick look at the QAT guides. And here I want to give you a couple of rules that will help guide you and what to put on the QAT. Because I found that most people treat their QAT a little bit like a PowerPoint command dumpster, 
which I personally think is the wrong approach. So I want to give you a couple of guidelines to at least think about when you start loading your QAT up with commands. And the first thing you want to keep in mind is that you want to reserve the QAT for commands that do not already have a shortcut associated with them. All right? Things like Control S for save, Control C for copy, Control D for duplicate, right? Commands like this are all great, but because they already have a control or an alt or a shift shortcut associated with them, whatever your command is, you know, they're bad candidates for the QAT. This QAT space is limited and it's way too valuable to have redundant shortcuts on it. So that's rule number one. No commands that already have a shortcut associated with them. The second thing to think about when you're thinking about commands that you want to put on your ribbon is you want to save it for commands that are four or five ribbon strokes deep or ribbon guides deep into the ribbon. And what the heck does that mean? So let me just demonstrate what I mean by that. If I come back to the normal view and I grab my slide, which is just a colored rectangle sitting over my slide, and I want to now align it to the left of my slide using my ribbon guides, it's five keystrokes deep. So if I hit and let go of the Alt key, my ribbon guides open, so that's one keystroke. If I hit and let go of the H key, that's two keystrokes. I'm going to hit G for the Arrange tool. The Arrange tool drop-down pops open. That's three strokes. I would then hit A for alignment, four strokes. And then I would hit L for left. And again, hands on the keyboard, my rectangle would snap to the left side of my slide. And in comparison, if I, again, with my mouse, I'm just going to drag this over, have that alignment tool on your QAT, which I recommend it being in the first position because I think the alignment tool is the most important command in PowerPoint. You know, in comparison, which was five keystrokes, if I use my uh, QAT, it would be one keystroke, so I hit and let go of the Alt key. I would then hit and let go of one, which would open up the alignment tool, and I would simply hit L for left, and it would snap into position. So taking a five keystroke ribbon guide shortcut, and turning it into three, which doesn't sound like a big time savings, but if you align things in your presentations like thousands of times a day like I do, that adds up to a lot of spare time. All right, so that's the second thing to think about. You want to save the QAT for commands that are more than five or four ribbon stroke or ribbon guides deep. The third thing and the final thing you want to think about, and we're going to get into the, the tips here in just a second, but the last thing you want to think about is the order of the commands on your QAT because this makes a big difference. And this is where we get really strategic and we break up our QAT into two sections. We have the keyboard section, so commands that you'll use your keyboard to hit, like the alignment tool, I have the font color, shape fill, shape outline, etc. They're on the keyboard section, okay, and they don't require your mouse to use or activate. And the second part is the mouse section, which you want to reserve for any command that requires you to use your mouse to interact with the command anyway, right? There is no speed advantage to using your keyboard. And if I hit escape, just to come back to the normal view, a great example of that is the shapes gallery, right? If with my mouse, I have the shapes gallery here on my QAT, I open the shapes gallery. If I was going to insert a block arrow, for example, and I'll just insert a big default one there on my slide, because I have to draw that arrow on my slide with my mouse, I can't do that with my keyboard, it again makes, no, there's no advantage to getting up there with my, uh, my alt shortcuts, my uh, ribbon guides, okay? I hope that makes sense. So I'm gonna hit delete, and now just to kind of cap off all of that before we get to the first set of sections, I wanna just show you, I have this big, ugly default rectangle with some text in it, I want to select this text box or rectangle, it doesn't make a difference, and I just want to kind of quickly cycle through a handful of shortcuts just to show you how much power and how much stuff you can get done just here on your keyboard. So with this rectangle selected, and again, I'm going to try to move slowly so you don't get lag time and miss this, I can first use a sequence of my QAT shortcuts, which again are all in that PDF, so I could Alt, Two, I could change the font color to black, hands on my keyboard. I could Alt-3, change the shape fill to white, I'll just hit enter. I could Alt-4 for shape outline. 
I could change the shape outline. I could, holding the control key, hit the forward bracket on my keyboard to change the text size up, or hit the backwards bracket to change the text size down. I could Alt H for home, U for bullets. Again, add bullet points, just like we talked about a second ago. I could align the text to the top, so Alt H for home, A T for align text, T for top. The text would snap to the top of my shape. I could also move the shape around on my slide, so I again could, using the alignment tool, hit Alt 1, open the alignment tool, hit H for distribute horizontally, and then there's a whole other handful of them, like holding the Alt key, hitting my right and left arrow keys that can, you know, tip my shape, grow my shape, all sorts of things, all on your keyboard. So this is what I mean by using your keyboard to cut through otherwise repetitive formatting tasks. I mean, that's the first huge time savings you can get just from using your keyboard. And I'm going to go back to full screen slideshow mode, and that is the first section. So that's your keyboard, that's your guides, your QAT, but please don't forget your dedicated mouse. And I want to stop right here and ask if anybody has any questions before we move on into the tips. Taylor, we definitely have some questions. So um, we have three or four, so I'll try awesome. and do them quickly. Um, number one, how did you turn on the QAT? The QAT is something that you actually cannot turn on or turn off. It's there. The only thing is that it's either, if I count them, let me see, I'm going to hit escape. Your QAT, you can see that mine, if you can see my screen is below the ribbon. It can only be in one of two places. It's either below the ribbon where mine currently is. Hit this little drop-down arrow. You can also show the QAT above the ribbon. Again, this is only on a PC. I don't think I don't believe this exists on a Mac. The equivalent of doing this on a Mac is you need to create custom toolbars. Um, you do have an option for above and below. I highly recommend having the QAT below because you have that mouse section of the QAT, so you might as well have it as close as possible. Would there be a QAT also in Word, for example, that would work similar? Absolutely. Absolutely. This, this is across the entire Office suite. So if you, it, they, they don't carry over. If you set it up in PowerPoint, this specific QAT does not carry over into Word because there's obviously Word commands right. that don't exist in PowerPoint and vice versa. But once you set it up, you can set it up in each and, every, each and every one of your programs, and I highly recommend that you do that. Terrific. There's, um, we're getting a lot of questions, and I think people just are curious about your style, where you've got Calibri slide title 24 content, so you have different sizes, and they want to know a little bit about what that is. What is the info? I mean, I know what it is, but it would be good for you to explain it. All of your the font sites, all the fonts and the outlines and the colors that you're using, I think is what you have on the left side of the slide. What that is basically is that is a kind of like his style guide for what he's doing. So I do know that we got a couple of other questions. Um, will what's on Taylor's um, QAT be cl included in the cheat sheet guide to kind of give you an idea as to what's there? And the answer is yes. Um, he w he does have exactly what he's been showing you on the cheat sheet. And we have another question, uh, which is, between the guides and the QAT, how long does it take to usually to memorize all these shortcuts? And I think that's really each individual. I don't think there's a specific time, but it happens a lot faster than you think. And if you practice on your own, incorporating some of the commands here and there until it becomes second nature, which is exactly how I know he teaches these hard skills in their course. Slowly more introducing more shortcuts, shortcuts as we show them how to build out entire slides in three minutes, which is pretty cool. So I think that's kind of that. At that point, I'm going to just see if we do have Taylor back and see if he's here. And it looks like he did have a little bit of, he is in Thailand, so I apologize for that. There will, uh, we will be giving you a guide right now that we will send out that will have all these cheat sheets in there. So 
I think that you'll find that some of this will really help you. And as Miguel just pointed out, it really depends on experience and how long you've used PowerPoint daily. I found PowerPoint to do a lot of things. And it, you know, it has incredible uses that you never thought of. And how it integrates across, whether it be yeah. Word or PowerPoint, is pretty interesting as well. So, Taylor, I've kind of tried to be you in a, in a raw form here. We've gotten through a lot of the questions. Awesome. But I think at this point what we'd like to do is just start on to the next slide. And I'll save the questions that awesome. we didn't answer for the next one. Okay, sounds good. Sorry about that. I quickly I lost my audio. So let's then move on. And the very first trick I want to share with you is breaking tables and charts. World class smart cuts. And, and here I want to do a quick poll. And the poll is how long would it take you? How long would it take you if I gave you this next slide? If I gave you this table, and this is just the default table, copy and pasted out of Excel and pasted into PowerPoint, and your task was to extract all of the information, so the years, the revenues, the net incomes, the net income percentages, into individual text boxes that you could then shuffle and rearrange into a more visual layout like this. All right, so the question is, how long would it take you to extract all this information into individual text boxes so that you could build a more visual layout like this. And the poll is, would it take you less than a minute, roughly five minutes, way more than five minutes, or all day long? We have launched the poll and we're getting people to answer. We'll close it shortly. We've got about 50% of the people answering. So, and what do you think the, the answer is going to be? It depends if people have uh, how much they've poked around our website and all that stuff. I'm going to guess people are going to say way more than five minutes, though. You, you are 100% correct. It is way more than five minutes is the answer. And I just shared the poll results with you so you can see it. And at this time, I'm going to hide the poll and give it back to you to share your desktop again. Awesome. So way more than five minutes. Well, I am going to show you how to do it in way less than one minute. All right. So I'm going to come to this next slide and I'm going to hit escape to come into the normal view. And the beauty of this trick is that it doesn't only work with tables, it works with charts. So first I'm going to show it on a chart, or first I'm going to show it on a table, then I want to do it on a chart. And the trick here is if I select my table, and you can see it is a table up there in my ribbon. I get my table tools um, tabs. If you cut your table, the same thing would work if you copy it. So control X for cut. If you then paste special, and there's two ways to get the paste special dialog box. You can, if you haven't gotten to your keyboard shortcuts yet, you can come up here to the home tab, paste drop down, there's a paste special uh, command right there. Or if you have your keyboard shortcuts down, it's Control-Alt-V on your keyboard to open up the Paste Special dialog box. And the two things you want to look at here are the Enhanced Meta File and the Windows Meta File. And this only works on PCs. I've tried this on a Mac. It doesn't work. You need to pick either one of these Meta File formats. It doesn't matter which one. I'm just going to pick the Windows Meta File format. You can see I get a picture of my table as a Meta File. Well, the only thing you need to know about a meta file is that, is that you can ungroup it. So if I now control shift G on my keyboard once, I get a warning dialog box. I will say yes. If I hit control shift G a second time, my entire table that was an Excel table breaks down into individual lines, shapes, and text boxes, right? You can see that I can freely move all these different pieces around. And this is a great example of where the selection pane is really, really useful. All right, I, I know we always talk about the selection pane, but we, uh, we rarely get to see it, an opportunity where it's really useful. So I'm going to show you now how to get rid of everything that you don't want. So if you launch the selections pane, there's a couple ways to do it. There's again, if I come up into my ribbon on the home tab, it's at the bottom of the arrange tool. There's a selections pane. If I come up to this little select, there's also another selection pane, that's where it is in the ribbon, or the keyboard shortcut for you is Alt F10. Hitting Alt F10, you should see the selections pane. 
snap open there on the right, and you can see it shows all of the different objects on my slide, which is not very helpful because it all just says rectangle and a number after it. But watch what happens now if I kind of sweep in, and I'm just going to grab a couple of these columns. This is the text that I want to save in this graphic or in this table that I've broken apart, and you can see that all of the objects are there highlighted in the selections pane. Well, if I now hit Control G for group, you can see that I get a group there in the selections pane, group 47. And with my mouse, if I then just click this eyeball icon to hide everything that I have selected, this is what I call selecting what you want to keep to get rid of, and if I just hit delete, everything you don't want to keep. Once something's hidden there in the selections pane, you cannot select it on your slide space. All right. So after I've deleted everything I don't want, I can click show all. My numbers snap back onto my slide. I can control shift G to ungroup. And you might occasionally have to trim an extra piece or two out that you accidentally grabbed. All right. So that is how to get all of the information out into text boxes in less than a minute so that you could build a more visual layout like this. And again, you can see that this is just all individual shapes, lines, and text boxes. And hopefully that made sense. And I do want to come and show you that this same trick, I'm going to close my selection pane again for a second, works for your charts. And oftentimes in consulting, maybe this is relevant for your industries as well, you would start with a chart and you would again want to create a more visual layout for the chart. Here I have just individual rectangles on the second slide. And the question always became, again, how do you get the exact you know, size and dimension rectangles out of this chart. And what a lot of people would do, myself included when I started out, is we would grab rectangles, we would do the old manual adjustment in the eyeball technique, you know, we'd try to create a bunch of these, we basically manually resize them. All right, it seems like a good idea, but there's a much faster way. So again, if I just select my chart, and there's a caveat to charts I'm going to show you in a second, control X to cut, I'll just do this one more time. Control-Alt-V for paste special. I want to choose the meta file format. Select OK. Control-Shift-G once. Select yes. Control-Shift-G a second time. Everything breaks down. And if I now come in, I'll zoom in a little bit. I will select the bars. I will select my years. Alt-F10 for my selection pane. You can see all the shapes there on the far right. I'll hit Control-G to group. I will hide the group, I will sweep in with my mouse, select everything I don't want, hit delete. Apologies if I'm moving quickly, I want to get on to some of the other tricks, and here you go, if I control to G, you now have all the different pieces, and I think you can also see that there's the outline of the pieces that are in there, so you actually get two charts at the same time that you can then massage and maneuver to kind of a more visual layout like this, okay? So that's how to take a table or a chart Break it apart so that you can then play with the individual pieces and make your own unique layout, make a more visual layout. The one thing I want to tell you about charts, if I move on to the next slide, this throws people for a curveball after I show them this trick. I show them this trick, they're psyched, they go back to their desk, they do it on their chart, and then they tell me it doesn't work. The one caveat you need to be careful of when working with charts is that if you use a default formatting, so if I select this chart here on the left, if I come up to the chart tools design tab, and if I just select, select a default chart, I'm then going to select both charts. I'll show you what this does. You can cut or paste as meta files multiple tables or charts at the same time. I'll control X to cut. I'll control Alt V for paste special. Meta file, select OK. This is just exactly what I just showed you. Ungroup once, Control Shift G, ungroup a second time. Notice that my default chart here on the left does not break as individual rectangles. This is what people tell me when they say it doesn't work. If you use a default chart format type, so just any of the default chart formatting types in PowerPoint, your chart will not break as individual rectangles. It will instead break as a group like this. So that's just a quirk around uh, of a curveball I've seen, a, I've seen a lot of people struggle with. And that is trick number one, breaking tables and charts, world-class smartphones.
where we're going on. So let's just quick, quick continue on. Let's move to the second one. Trick number two, breaking smart art, aya karate chop. And on this one, I want to ask you a personal PowerPoint question, and I want you to be fairly honest with me. On the love-hate relationship of life, where do you stand on smart art? Do you love it? Do you hate it? Or do you either not care or don't know about it? Which if that's the case, I'm going to show you some great tricks for using it like a pro. So don't worry if that's you. Let's do a poll. How do you feel about smart art on the love-hate relationship? Do you love it, hate it, don't care, or don't know about it? And we're neck and neck, and we are going to close the poll at this time. And I'm going to share the results. And it, 43% don't care, 37 love it, 21% hate it. Wow, I am surprised. I was expecting a lot more uh, of the hating part. Well, I am going to show you some clever tricks for using it. So for those who don't care or didn't know about it or those who hate it, I think I'm going to hopefully change your mind. But first, I just want to talk about the theory of smart art very, very quickly. Um, smart art is great for inspiration, and you'll actually see more of this in the next trick. But in my opinion, it's not great for just about everything else, right? You can't, it's a pain to format. You can't align objects outside of SmartArt to objects that are inside of SmartArt, which is difficult. And for none of the other reasons, it's just very difficult to work with. But the absolute worst thing about SmartArt is that it looks like SmartArt, all right? If you're building a presentation, you're getting paid top dollar to build a presentation, and you just plop in a big old ugly piece of smart art on your slide, it's not going to give the impression that you spent a lot of time thinking about your presentation. So that doesn't inspire much confidence. So I always encourage you to move away from smart art, which is what we're going to look at when I talk about breaking it. And just as a classic example, this is probably one of the most frequently used smart arts, pieces of smart art that I've seen used. You know, this is just a default piece, and yes, you can change the colors. Yes, there's all these, you know, you can put bevels and all sorts of stuff on it. But in just under two minutes, like I'm going to show you, you can take something like this, break it apart. Again, I'll show this to you in a second, and quickly throw the pieces around and build something a little bit more elegant like this. And this slide itself, you know, could use a lot of work. But if you just worked on it for two minutes, this is not a bad slide to end up with. This is not as nearly as apparent to be a smart art. And I hope you agree. With that, I want to actually show you how to do this. So I'm going to go move to the next slide. I'm going to hit escape, uh, where I just have a big old default uh, hierarchy here. Because this is where I see the most people get stuck with smart art. They usually are reaching for smart art for hierarchies. And there's three tricks here for you, actually. So first off, if you, for anyone who's never used smart art, just to show you the pain, if I click in and I resize, or I try to resize some of these rectangles, you can see that the whole graphic kind of freaks out. My marketing and logistics rectangles got small, everything else got big. You know, that can be a real pain. And yes, again, you can kind of come up here into the design tab. You can, you know, color this. this is what, you know, one way I see people try to kind of dress up their smart art, but this, at the end of the day, this is not getting you very far. On top of that, for hierarchies, I see a lot of people struggle with this, is that these lines are not lines. If you notice, if I select this line, I am not allowed within SmartArt to move it, so I can't really adjust where things are. And on top of that, I can't add lines, for example, to my marketing rectangle and drag it up over here onto the finance rectangle. All right, So you're very, very limited in what you can do. So the first trick is just to simply break it. Use SmartArt to generate your shapes because SmartArt will build your shapes and lay out your rectangles much faster than you can actually build them yourself. Once you have it, you just Control Shift G for ungroup. If I Control Shift G once, the SmartArt graphic breaks. If I hit Control Shift G a second time, you can see it breaks down into these different shapes, lines, and rectangles. All right, and just to save time, I'm going to flip to the next slide, which is this same layout with the lines deleted. I just deleted the lines. And I just kind of formatted 
all of the different rectangles into kind of just these base tone colors, all right? So this is where I've gotten, to you, gotten you to so far. You've broken the graphic, you've deleted the lines, I've rearranged things a little bit, but now we come to the second trick. There's three tricks on this one in total. So first you break your smarter graphic. Trick number two, or where I see people get stuck, is they now want to hook up the lines. And the first problem, if I just grab a line, I have mine on my QAT, is that if I come over here to hook my line up to my rectangle, notice that I'm, all, I'm not given the normal connection points in the center of the rectangle. I'm only given these connection points here on the corners of the rectangles, which is a pain. I mean, you don't really want to connect your rectangles like this. So, the, of course, the first question people have is, what happened to my connection points? And the way to fix this, if this happens to you, which it will if you use hierarchies with SmartArt, you first want to select all of your rectangles. You simply go up to the Drawing Tools Format tab. I'm going to go slowly because I know there's some screen lag. You come over to Edit Shapes. Under the Edit Shape dialog, you want to come to Change Shape. And for Change Shape, you just want to reselect the rectangle. All right? Reselecting the rectangle, if I now come into my Shapes Gallery, I'm going to grab an elbow connector. Notice that I once again have the natural connection points that I can now draw my lines in however I see fit for this layout. So that's trick number two. You break your smart art hierarchy. The shapes have lost their connection points. You quickly uh, change their shape back to a rectangle and you can put those lines in. Well, now the second part of this is, well, how do I add all my lines really fast? If we go back to this, if it takes someone 20 minutes to do it, how do I do it in two? Right? You don't want to be inserting lines one after the other. And that comes to the lock drawing mode, which to me was always the most worthless PowerPoint tool until I teamed it up with hierarchies. And the way this works, I'm just going to show you, if I come to my Shapes Gallery, if I come to my elbow connector, instead of clicking it, I right click it, you get this little hidden menu, and there's this thing called the lock drawing mode. And the only thing you need to know about the lock drawing mode is that once you select it, you can freestyle draw in as many lines as you want until you hit the escape key. So if this was my hierarchy and I wanted to fill it in, locking the elbow connectors allows me to come through my entire diagram in one pass and add all these different lines. And I can also add any other lines that I want, which I was not able to do in SmartArt. I'll hit escape. And you can see that I can quickly draw in as many lines as I want. And then once you have these lines, you can format them just like any normal line. All right, so that's the third trick. Breaking SmartArt, changing your rectangles back into rectangles, and then using the lock drawing mode to quickly fill in your uh, hierarchy. So all that's to say, SmartArt is great for inspiration. It's not great for anything else. So that's trick number two, breaking smart art. I uh, karate chop. Do we have any questions here? I realize we're running a bit longer. So he said that's trick number two, breaking smart art, a love-hate relationship. Once you break smart art, can you go back to smart art? Uh, the answer is no and yes. Um, once you break smart art, you can't technically go back to it unless you control Z to undo, but that takes you right back to smart art. That said, in trick number five, I'm going to show you how to backtrack to it anyway, not using Control Z. That's one of my favorite. My, it's one of my favorite tricks. So that's actually a really great question. To trick number three, we've got three more tricks. Breaking bullet points, regardless of how you get them. And again, let's launch another quick poll. And the poll is: Do you use lots of bullet points, and sometimes underlined, struggle to lay them out visually? Do you use lots of bullet points and occasionally struggle to lay them out visually? Yes or no? That's a pretty sophisticated answer. It's definitely yes. So we got the answers pretty quickly from the audience. Awesome. And I'm just going to quickly show a, a favorite quote that I saw someone leave as an Amazon book review because I am kindred spirits with this person when they say most of my clients with my work want bullets. In fact, that's how most of their information is delivered. So the real challenge I have is how to make them interesting, informative, attractive, and conceptual. That's okay. 
So there's, this is just an Amazon review. I love this. I wish this was a famous, famous quote because this is exactly how I felt when, in my job last, when I was last working in finance, right? Trying to make my bullet points an interesting, informative, attractive, and conceptual, I was not allowed to just get rid of them all. And so that's what this trick's really touching on. And first off, I just want to quickly, if I come back to the normal view, go through a couple places where you're, you might be overlooking where you can actually get bullet points to feed into this trick. So I'm just going to quickly do this. I know we're running uh, low on time. First off, you can type bullet points, right? That's pretty obvious. You get them from your emails. You get them from copying and pasting online. Um, you start with a list of bullet points. Another place I see people not taking advantage of bullet points is Excel. So if I could just quickly open an Excel document, and I think you can see this Excel document. If I come in and just control C, I'll just select this range of cells, control C to copy here in Excel. I'll click back to PowerPoint. If I control V to paste, the standard operation is I get a table here in PowerPoint. Oops, I can't move it for this trick to work. I have to control V to paste. And then immediately here in the corner, you open up this Paste Special dialog box. You get a bunch of options. The last option will change all of your, or turn your entire table into text in a text box so that if you then use your ribbon guides, Alt-H-U, you are back to bullet points. All right? So that's one area where I see people not getting the most out of their bullet points to feed into this next trick. Another great place that you might be overlooking is the outline view of your presentation. And you can get there by hitting Control Shift Tabs on your keyboard, which turns the left side of your screen from uh, uh, thumbnails of your slides to actual, the actual text in your titles and subtitles. So for example, I'm here on slide number 58. Imagine that I was tasked with creating a summary slide for slides 59 through 61, and these were, instead of the current titles, these were the steps of a process, the phases of a training project, I mean, just about any little piece of a whole, and I needed to make a summary slide. I can, here in the outline view, select it, control C to copy. I will control shift tab on my keyboard to close the outline view. I then need to come back to, it looks like I lost the slide I was on. If I come back to slide 58, if I now control V to paste, you can see that I can actually paste my titles and subtitles into PowerPoint, Alt-H-U for bullets. And I can again take that information, get into bullet point formation, and feed it into this next trick I'm going to show you. The fourth place where people don't realize that they can get bullet points is from shapes. You can actually take all of the text in shapes, even though they're all in different shapes, and force it back into a list of bullet points, which I'm going to show you right at the end. But So let's not get overcomplicated now. I want to just quickly flip to this example. Here is a great example of a slide that you don't want to make. This is uh, probably the classic death by PowerPoint. I just have four big bullet points and a title. And although this is where your uh, research or your slide might start out, you don't want to stop here. But the question is, what if you had no idea where to get started, right? And you don't want to spend all day at the whiteboard or all day going back and forth with your colleagues. Your job is to come up with layout ideas. Well, the fastest way I know how to do this is to feed it into SmartArt. And there's two ways to do this. With your text, if you select some of the text, so you click into the object itself, you right click. On your right click menu, you get this little fly out, convert to SmartArt. That's one technique. The other technique, if you select the text box, you come up to the Home tab, you come to Convert to SmartArt, look what happens as I start to hover over different SmartArt graphics. PowerPoint takes my bullet points and just throws them at these different graphics, starting to give me a little bit of a visual layout that I can start to think about whether or not this works for my bullet points. And if you've never used this before, I'm just going to click this vertical bulleted list. Once you throw your bullet points at SmartArt, you get your SmartArt tools tab up in your ribbon. You also get a drop down, which will, based on the category you chose, give you even more options that weren't originally available to you. For now, I'm just going to pick this group list, select the group list, like that. Once you're into the group list, if you've never used SmartArt before, you simply click in here, hit enter, hit tab. Uh, SmartArt is le level driven, enter tab. 
you can look this up online. This is not advanced, right? So once you've massaged your text, your text or your bullet points into a smarter graphic, you've moved it around, you found the one you like. Again, I would highly recommend you Control Shift G once, Control Shift G a second time, break the graphic, which then allows you to manually move, massage, do anything you want, which might end up into something like this. All right. So from a list of bullet points, having no idea where to get started, you throw it, you throw it at SmartArt, you get some ideas, you break it apart, and you build something that does not look like SmartArt. So that's breaking a list of bullet points. So SmartArt is great for inspiration, but not great for anything else. And I want to show you just one other quick example. I'm just going to click through this example. This is uh, doing a program trying to target key opinion leaders. This is from PR and Marketing. So if this was the start of your project, right, this is not the slide you want to end up with. This is the start of your slide. And you have three different programs that you're going to run for the client. You're going to do these special events. And each of these special events has a step on it. If you had no idea where to get started, you could very quickly generate ideas. If I go to the next slide, by simply taking a list of bullet points and maybe you throw it at SmartArt, and option number one, you come up with this kind of chevron-looking list, and you think, hey, I, I like the chevron aspect, right? I have steps to a process. I like the little chevrons marching left to right across my screen. Kind of cool. Well, then you take another text box, and you throw it at a different smart art graphic, and you think, all right, I kind of like these rectangles there at the top, you know, to, to, to kind of hold the different incentive programs. And although both of these, as individual pieces of smart art, scream smart art, if you take these, as I just showed you, break them apart, and maybe just shuffle them together like a deck of cards, you could very quickly generate a slide like this, right? Which is not nearly as apparent that this was all inspired by SmartArt. And yes, this is a lot of information to have on the slide, but if your client asks, asks you for the project overview and asks for it specifically in PowerPoint, you can't send it to them in Word, you can't send them an Excel spreadsheet, you know, good luck trying to summarize all this information up in a single picture. All right? So that's, again, breaking bullet points but using smart art for inspiration. And that is the end of trick number three, breaking bullet points regardless of how you get them. Uh, do we want to do another question now, Sharon, or should we continue on? We do have a quick question. So do you always use smart art for your bullets, or do you sometimes leave them as they are? Do I always use smart for my bullets? Um, that's a good question. I obviously have, and I'm sure you have yourself, some go-to layouts for ways that you like to lay points. I get a list of bullet points. I'll typically lean towards those layouts that I've already used before just because it's easier. But when I'm working with something or looking for new inspiration, I definitely cycle through SmartArt to find fast inspiration for my bullet points. So hopefully that answers that question. So yes. I, it's kind of both, I guess. Terrific. I think it's time for you to move on. Trick number four, photo cropping to uniformity and beyond. And this is by far everybody's favorite trick. So let's do a poll. How long would it take you? How long would it take you if I gave you this slide with eight pictures on it and your job was to crop and resize them all into the same size and shape so we could lay them out across the screen and then add a 50% transparency to all the pictures. So how long would it take you to complete the task? Would it take you less than a minute, roughly five minutes, way more than five minutes, or all day long? What do you think? We have people who are answering. We have about 48% of the people have, have answered. And right now, the, the clear winner by a huge margin is way more than five minutes. So they're still doing it. All right, so let's look at how to do this in way less than one minute, right? So if I come in here to my graphic, again, I have all these different odd-sized shapes and photos or just photos. Trick here is if you first select everything, I'm going to select all my photos minus my subtitle. The super, super, super fast way to crop and resize your photos, select your photos, come up to the picture tools format tab, I hope someone didn't start a, a start a top, stop our, stopwatch on me. You come to the picture layout drop down, and just like we did with bullet points, notice 
if I start to hover over these different smart art graphics, PowerPoint will automatically crop and resize all of my photos for me. I quickly pick a layout that I like. I can then, you know, crop and re or resize the, the layout. I would again highly recommend that you then break the graphics. So Control Shift G once, Control Shift G a second time. You then can sweep in and remove the titles or use these titles or create your own titles any way you want like that. And from here you would obviously need to arrange your pictures any way you want. But that is the fastest way that I know to crop and resize photos in less than a minute. And if you have a sharp eye, let me go to this next slide. This is a common question I get. What happened to my photo? Right. So here on the right, I have the original photo. Here on the left, I have the photo that came out of SmartArt. So this is what PowerPoint cropped and resized my photo to. And you can tell that it's not the same. So PowerPoint takes its best guess at getting down to what you want, but it's not always correct. But do not fret. You just right click your photo. You come to Format Picture. You want to cycle or navigate to the picture icon here in the dialog box. You want to navigate to the Crop menu. And this might be in different places depending on which version of PowerPoint you're using. If you come down, you always have an offset X and an offset Y. And you can use these to adjust the photo within the, the cropped area that PowerPoint has given it to you. All right? So your entire photo is still there. It's just PowerPoint's guessed where it is. You still have control of where it is. So that, that's the quick workaround for using SmartArt. Now to the transparency side of life, which is the second part of that, uh, let's first just talk about picture transparencies, and then I'll show you why using SmartArt makes that even faster. So in PowerPoint, if you want to add a transparency to a picture, it's technically impossible. You're not allowed to add a transparency to a picture. So the workaround, like many things, there's a workaround, uh, is to first take your photo, control C to copy on my keyboard. You want to right click a shape. Here I have a rectangle that's the same size and shape as my picture. You come to format shape. You want to navigate to the tipped over paint bucket. You want to come to fill. You want to come to a picture or texture fill. And then you want to, if you've copied it, you can just click clip art. I'm going to insert from a file. You can see that my photos warped, which you don't want. You just need to adjust your offsets down below. You want those to be zero. As long as the shape you're pasting it into is the same size as your photo, it'll, it, it will not warp or stretch like that. And then once you have it, you can either spin this uh, transparency bar or you can just type how much transparency you want. So that's how to add a picture transparency one at a time to a photo. But the beauty of this trick, cropping and resizing photos, this is just the same photos I cropped and resized with SmartArt a second ago, is that the way that PowerPoint crops your photos is actually by first filling rectangles with your pictures. So as soon as you've broken a SmartArt graphic with your pictures, if you select them all, right click, format objects, I'm back in this dialog, come to the fill icon, there you can see the transparency. I'm going to type 50% transparency, hit enter. All my pictures become transparent. I will just drop a rectangle. And I'm going to do Alt-3, fill it black, and Alt-6 for uh, the arrange tool, and hit K to send it back. You can now see, I'm not saying this is a final slide, you can see that that shape color is bleeding through my picture. So that's how you can take an almost infinite amount, amount of pictures. In less than a minute, you can crop and resize them. And then you can make them transparent. Super fast. So again, taking, taking these tasks that would take most people a lot of time and doing them very, very rapidly so you can spend the time on your content or on your expertise. Uh, so that's trick number four, photo cropping, one of my personal favorites. Do we have any questions there? We do have a question. Do you have to worry about warping and distortion when you're using smart art like this? I mean, like we just saw that you kind of did that yourself, but. Um, I, in my own experience, I haven't had any issues with um, warping and distortion using uh, the smart art tool. As you, as you saw a second ago, you can obviously adjust that. 
but I do want to make the point this this does this trick does not work for every single picture. Um, some logos, some kind of some icons doesn't turn out right. But this is such a fast trick that this is always my first cut attempt at cropping and resizing photos. So if you do find that you're getting distortion and you can't get rid of it, you'll have to go back to the manual cropping technique. But this is the absolute fast. I think we lost you there for a second, Taylor. So let me just fill in why we're why we're you're coming back. Miguel um, actually okay. said that he doesn't feel that it's impo it's not at all impossible to add a transparency to um, any image. You just use a, an image filled shape, and that that's how you do it. In his opinion, just another point of view from that point. Correct. So for the image filled shape, that's what I did in that one-off trick. I took a picture, right. I filled it into a shape, and then we add the transparency. So correct, that is the workaround. But you can't just take a photo and just apply transparency immediately to it. So he is correct. The last trick, uh, breaking shapes, doing the impossible. And here I again want to do another poll. What is the fastest way, and the fastest way to what? If you were given a slide deck, maybe a proposal with a bunch of numbers in it, and your job, I'm going to hit escape from the normal view, was to cycle through and add up all the different numbers to make sure that all of your totals were correct. And here I just have four numbers, but assuming that you had a bunch of them, what is the fastest way to cycle through and double check your numbers in PowerPoint? So what's the fastest way? Type the numbers into Excel. I'm going to say type the numbers manually into Excel. Should you use mental arithmetic, use a calculator, or other? What's the fastest way to double check your numbers in PowerPoint? And we've got about 15% of the people. We'll give it another 30 seconds. I know for me, is I would say type the numbers into Excel. At least that's what I do. Um, and that's kind of the best way for me. But we'll see if I'm the norm or if the, how other people are doing it. And what you'll see okay. is we have type into Excel is clearly the the larger number, it's about 38%, 29% use a calculator, 31% do other. So that's kind of interesting. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm interested to know what the other other is. Um, I'm going to show you how I, I, I agree you do want to do this in Excel, but I do want to move you away from doing anything manually. So retyping numbers in Excel is not a super good uh, a productive use of your time. So if I'm in here in PowerPoint, the normal view, here's the four numbers that I want to add up. This works with as many numbers as you have. The trick to get this into PowerPoint or into Excel is you first, you want to insert a picture. This is going to seem odd, just bear with me. So I'm going to come to insert. I'm just going to select a screenshot of an Excel window that I have open. Just grab a picture. Any picture will work. It doesn't really matter for this trick. Once you have a picture on your slide, if you select, hold and shift, whatever numbers that are sitting there in individual objects, all right, this is not a real table, select, hold and shift, all of the numbers that you want, hold and shift, select the picture. Now, I always, after I do this, control drag to the right, or control shift drag, and we want to do it so I create a copy, because this will actually break my numbers. With everything selected, come to the picture tools format tab, Come back to the picture layout, pick one of these different layouts. I always pick this circular picture callout. Don't worry, your layout's going to look horrendous. Let me move this on my screen here so you can see this and I'll make it bigger. It looks like I'm getting far away from my task at hand, but if I take this smart art graphic, which is taking all the numbers and my picture, throw them into a layout, come up to the convert to drop down, convert to text. All of my numbers are thrown into a list of bullet points. If I then remove the bullet points, so Alt H U for none, I can then, instead of manually typing these into Excel, Control C to copy, I can move back to Excel. I'm just going to Control V to paste them down below. My numbers come in. Control equal sign for an auto sum. You can see the actual total is 29092. I'll Control C to copy that come back to my presentation, come to the total. Uh, actually, I had already updated it here, so it was correct. But I could control V to paste if it wasn't correct. 
hit the control key, and then just paste the text so that I retain my formatting here in PowerPoint. All right? So that's breaking shapes into a list of bullet points, which is super useful if you have lots of numbers in your presentation. Does that make sense? And hopefully somebody was ooing and aahing for that one because it didn't go any better. That is amazing. <laughs> All right? So now besides numbers, this trick is also super useful. If I go back to this example and I'm just going to click through this, I'm not going to do this again because you already know how to do it. If this was the slide that someone sent you, and what if you don't like it, right? It's good, bound to happen to you. Your colleague sends it to you, you don't like it. Well, how do you start over from scratch and cycle back through Smarter? And if you did exactly what I just showed you how to do, you insert a picture, you throw it at a picture layout, you convert it to text, you'll end up with something like this, just like I showed you. Once you get something like this, you can then throw it at a smart art graphic. I have picked one with pictures. Uh, you then bring in the pictures for your presentation that you want. As you now know, smart art will crop and resize your photos for you, or you can just copy and paste them into the graphic if it's a picture or layout. This is what it would look like, pasting the pictures into the layout. From here, you could control shift G to ungroup, break apart the graphic, which then allows you to rearrange and format anything however you like. Here I've taken the titles and put them above the picture. The percentages are still down below and I've formatted the top. From here you could throw some extra rectangles in for a little bit of diversity. And you could finally just center it on your slide. So again, using this trick, breaking your shapes back into bullet points, you can very quickly move from a slide layout that you don't like, come up with some new inspiration, and end up with something more visual that you do like. So that is the last trick. And just as we're at the end of this, just as a quick theory recap before we do a bunch of questions. Um, so we talked about speed is on your keyboard, uh, which is hugely important. We talked about the setup, all right, using your ribbon guides, looking at your QAT and how you set that up. We looked at a bunch of awesome tricks, uh, pulling information out of your tables, so breaking your tables or breaking your charts. We looked at breaking the smart art, so getting away from the, the lackings of smart art so you can make your own layouts. We looked at breaking bullet points, throwing them at smart art graphics uh, for inspiration and then breaking them apart again, so lots of breaking. We looked at cropping and resizing multiple photos all at the same time, and we just looked at breaking shapes back into bullet points. Again, all of these tips and tricks and all of this theory is covered in that PDF handout that you can download from Presentation Expert, but I do want to say that this is all just the tip of the iceberg, all right? Camille and I have been in the trenches ourselves and we've struggled with all these issues, and what we've done is we have pulled all of our best practices together into an online training course, so if you do want to take your skills to the next step, um, you can take this course, and I do want to say that if you use PowerPoint on a daily basis for your job, there is no better course out there for you, period, that I know of that will teach you these kind of tips and tricks for speed and efficiency. All right, and here's just a quick little quote from one of our, our new students who just finished module one, which I thought was cute. She says, you saved me from a night of working on my PowerPoint, aligning everything and still having crazy objects everywhere. Instead, I went to bed at 10 and had no issues with the presentations, which I think is awesome. And there are some bonuses. If you do want to join our course and you did attend this live webinar, uh, the bonuses are our speed training course is just $98, which is a deal. But for attending the webinar, you will also get a free upgrade to our new course, which we're coming out in 2015, which we're super excited about. You will get a 200 cut and paste slide deck that you can use in your own presentations. And for people who join the webinar, you will get a 45 minute coaching session with Camille and I. And I have an asterisk there because we do need to limit this to 75 people. If hundreds of people do this, we don't have that much time. So if you're interested in getting that free coaching session, uh, you should definitely act quickly. And all you have to do is just head over to the web link nbpt.com which will redirect you to that page. Just scroll down, find the Click Now button. You'll see the bundle. You'll automatically be enrolled. And again, the first 75 people will get that coaching session with us, which we can do whatever you want to do. All right? 
With all of that said, I hope you learned a lot and got a lot of new ideas, and we will hopefully see you at happy hour. And my O got misplaced there. With that, if we want to go back and do any questions, I am happy to answer any questions. We have a lot of questions, um, and I think people are just awesome. raving about this. Amazing webinar. That's great. Um, people had to, a few people had to log off. Um, Jen wanted, Jerry wanted to know, um, how do you discover all of your tips and tricks? Do you have a spe specific task in mind and try to hack it, or is there another process? Uh, it's the hacking process. Um, we basically, and I, I mean, I am always floored, you know, not just in PowerPoint, but in, in Excel to see what creative ways people come up with to solve problems that most people have never thought about. So I'm a big Excel user, uh, and we basically did the same thing with PowerPoint. What's your task? Anything, I almost find that anything that's repetitive can be hacked. Right? If it's taking you forever and ever and ever, you don't need to know Visual Basic. If it's repetitive, there's probably a hack or there's probably a way to work around it much faster. That's where we came up with all these tips and tricks that um, I showed you today. Lots of comments like, who knew PowerPoint could do this? Um, thanks so much for the great tips. Again, if you want to really look and getting all of the tips and the tricks I've been putting, the URLs in this session um, notes so you can see it. You just go to the top URL. They're both on the bottom of that page. And we want to thank you for attending and joining us today. The recording link will be out in a few days, and we will get an email with that. And we ask you to also uh, take our survey. And then mark your calendars. We do have a couple of great webinars planned for this year, several actually. The next is the 20-minute template, Build Your Own Branded Design Without Being a Designer with Bethany Auk from SlideRabbit. And Mike Parkinson is coming back in March with five presentations, Silver Bullets, and we have a host of other speakers coming in 2015. I want to thank everyone for joining us. If you have any questions, feel free to email me at webinars at presentationexpert.com. We'll try and get them answered after the fact, whether it be in our Google Plus community or I'll answer them directly and post the responses. And I want to thank Taylor for joining us today. Thank you, everyone.